25% humidity and 88 degrees. It's pretty good. So these supers uh, sat over a BS gate for two and a half or three days. And then I will let them sit in the drying room at least two days. Uh, I've got air blowing through the stacks. I've got stickers underneath. So air can go all the way through. And the humidity in here was 25% and uh, temperature about 88 degrees. This allows me to dry honey out. Uh, I can lower the content of uncapped honey by a lot. You know, I can bring it from 20, 21% down to 15 or 16% in three days. Um, what I've seen in years past. Now, hive beetles are an issue when you're doing this. And Bob Benny does this as well. And I asked Bob, you know, if you're letting supers sit over an escape for three or four days, and then you let them sit in your drying room for three days, are you not getting hive beetle problems? And he said that he wasn't. And I think I know why my friend Mike Berry, who has a, uh, a, a YouTube channel as well on beekeeping, he sent me a paper where they, it indicates that high airflow, low humidity environments kill high beetle eggs and it dries out the young larvae. Now what I've seen in the past two years is in these conditions, I will have adult hive beetles in these supers and I will see them during extraction, but I see no larvae, I don't see eggs, I don't see anything getting slimed. So I tend to believe that. I think this high airflow, low humidity environment uh, keeps the hive beetles from sliming these supers. Big helper. Taking her to the doctor and I'm waiting for the appointment in the parking lot. This little margin area, they've got white sweet clover planted. And the bees are Thank just pounding it. Bees. Thank you, sweetie. This would be a much better use for interstate mediums than mowing. Plant it to sweet clover. Six and 26% humidity. That'll work. I think most of this was capped anyway, so I'll try to extract this this afternoon or tonight. I need to free that comb up. We're uh, June 13th, and the sourwood flow will generally start by around June 20th. Um, I'm trying to watch that pretty close, but I need to, I need to have supers ready to go when those flowers open, I want to I want to pull off everything I can and give them empty supers so I can, I can try to capture any of it that I may get. So 
this Tuesday morning. Yesterday, my little girl had a double ear infection, so she stayed with me. I had to take her to the doctor and didn't get a lot of work done. We did clean some in the honey house. So uh, I'm out making my rounds this morning. Just, I'm trying to tidy up. Like it really annoys me if things aren't consistent or if I have one thing left undone. This yard of nukes, I just am leaving. I moved, I forget, 10 or 13 hives over here on Saturday and one of them didn't have a feeder in it and I couldn't feed it. And I was thinking, well, I'll just get them next week. And now it's been bugging me to death. I've got another yard of nukes where I ran out of syrup and five of them didn't get fed. So I'm, I've just got to get that cleaned up. I've got to clean that up or it's gonna annoy me to death. And then I'm gonna head out to another yard where I've got some nukes that don't have feeders in them. They're older. They do have a lot of honey. They were uh, double screen board splits and stuff on the hives that had cells and all kinds of stuff. I'm just trying to get everything consistent and I'm going to get some honey set up over escapes and try to get done before it gets too hot. And then go work honey. I saw some basswood yesterday where the flower clusters had not opened yet. Now I have tasted just a, a hint, just a hint of basswood in one yard but i think i think that uh, that was premature i don't think the basswood flow has started yet i don't think sourwood has started i think my bees are probably working smooth sumac and it's been a pretty decent flow some of them are drawing foundations the smaller ones are drawing foundations are the ones that are compressed you know like two double mediums with an excluder are drawing foundations, whereas the big ones are just backfilling the brood nest. Which I guess is okay because they'll be set up for winter and I won't have to feed them. But I could use the honey this year. Because honey is money. And I need I need cash flow to fuel my expansion. The next couple of years I'm gonna be pretty hungry for capital and on a shoestring budget you need a lot of things and you don't have the revenue to uh, get those things it just makes things more challenging so Taking about four years to finally get a crack in the stainless on the side of this thing. I ordered a new one the other day just, just to have one. I forgot to fill up my fuel bucket. Need more wood pellets and pine needles in there. This should get me through today, though. There's a lot of wood pellets in there. So it's early in the day. It's cold, uh, cool, I'd say. Propolis is cold. So I'm getting those pops when I open a hive up. And this, this hive is just mean. Uh, they don't like it. They just rushed out, stung me, you know, gang stung me on my hands and I've been stung probably 10 times just by them. So what I'm gonna do with them is they're gonna get a red push pin right here. That's where I'm, I mark attitude. And a red push pin there means that they are, when I do my next round of nukes, they're gonna get busted up completely. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna put up with that. So this is one way that I'm gonna weed these genetics out of my entire operation. I also have them in an out yard, so they can't, their drones cannot mate with my mating yard. So that's another way. Uh, the feistier colonies go to out yards, the gentler ones that perform well with mites and have other traits I'm looking for. 
um, you know, they, I'll use those drones. But if, if a colony makes me put gloves on these days, no, they're, they're not going to, uh, they're not gonna make it. This was a nuke from this spring. After they got three boxes drawn out, I quit feeding them and they're starting to work on this super up here. It looks like I do have some Man Lake plastic frames in there. I'm gonna pull those out. The bees do not draw them well at all. So I'll pull those out. We're gonna give this a taste test. Color looks good. Oh, that's outstanding. Woo! That is outstanding. It's got this long taste profile. It's got a tanginess to it. All the way from beginning to end. I don't know what that is. Sourwood is more subtle than that, and it's got this earthy, underlaying flavor. I'm betting this is smooth sumac, but I don't know for sure. It could be buckthorn or something else. I don't know. It's really good. And they're drawing foundations on it, so that's, that's a positive thing. So here I've got a hive that was strong in spring. Uh, they had two supers on them. This one is a box of foundation with a bait frame. They've not done anything with it. And then they've got a box of drawn combs that is maybe 60% full. I'm not seeing a big population in there. That tells me there's something going on with this hive. So I'm taking that partially full super and putting it on this strong nuke that I started this spring. They have drawn out and three boxes and i just put a box of foundation on them now i'm going to stick this super on there and then put their box of foundation on top of that they may fill both of those i'll dive into this one and queen check them uh, there's a good chance that um you know they swarmed or tried to requeen and she didn't come back or something is going on there that um, i need to find out so the first frame I pulled out, and there's my answer. They swarmed on me. They're not gonna do anything the rest of the year. I just need to make sure they're queen right. This is a point that I've learned about beekeeping, especially if you're trying to make money at it. You reinforce your strength, you redeploy your weakness. You give your assets to your strong colonies because they're the money makers. You use your weak colonies to reinforce the big colonies. Or you just bust them up completely and make new colonies with them. Always be thinking about using your assets and putting them to the highest and best use. What? Pretty cool seeing that bee being born. Don't really get tired of that. So since that third was full of honey, there's no brood in it. I just set, a, set it over a bee escape. I am going to pull that. And that means I'll get one and a half supers of honey off this colony. And then if they want to go queenless, I'll just bust them up and save my equipment. <laughs> so my horizontal hive swarmed at least a couple times uh, with a primary and at least one after swarm this year. And it's been a while and I'm out here in my yard and I thought, oh, I better check and make sure they requeen. That's the first frame I pulled out. That makes me think we're either drone layer or laying worker in here. I'll check and pull another frame and see. They're calm. A lot of times laying worker hives are not calm. Yeah, I need a queen. 
darn it. So this colony has mostly filled up their fifth. Their fourth is completely filled up. I gave them a sixth of foundation with a bait frame. They've not done anything up there. And population still looks okay. So I'd say they're queen right, but I don't know that they're gonna do a lot more for me this year. They don't have an excluder, but that fourth is all honey. I'd say they're gonna overwinter just fine. They're gonna keep trucking. Pull two supers of honey off of them. May get a third if we get some basswood. I just, my point here is I don't know that this is the kind of bee I want. You know, they're holding their own. They're holding their own. They're not a lot of maintenance. But I think I could get more production from them. I really do. I wasn't able to pull a lot of brood frames out of them in the spring either for splits so they're just not as productive i don't know i have to think about them so this hive right here i just shook down the fourth they did have some brood in there she's got nearly three boxes of honey there that i'm going to get and they're gentle they're gentle I've grafted from her two different times this year. She's one of my most productive queens. Uh, you can kind of see my numbering system here. Sharpie marker on a telescopic lid will last several months, but it does go away. So every year you're kind of starting fresh. My first inspection of the year, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Bet my wife loved that. They were heavy, they were queen right. I reversed them, they were strong. Uh, thought she might be a breeder. Three, four, gave them a box. And they were on track. Four, nine, they were a little slow. Looks like I did not pull a split out of them this year. That hive was perfectly on track. They never got swarmy. Huh. If I'd fed them, I bet I would have pulled splits out of them. This is one of Corey Stevens' queens. That was a double nuke. I gave them a box, and they're starting to draw that out. They've got a pretty good population. I just found a production colony down here that has a super with some drawn comb in it, and they're not doing a lot with it. So they must have gone through a queen change or they don't have a queen or something. They're just not doing much with it. They, the population doesn't look that bad. But this super is gonna go on this nuke over here and I'll see if they'll finish it out. This thing's only got about 15 pounds of honey in it. Redeploy assets. Reinforce strength, redeploy weakness. There's another colony that swarmed. I pulled a split out of them when they swarmed, left them with some cells, and they've gone laying worker. I've had a terrible time this year with colonies that swarm not requeening, which I don't, I'd have to look at my notes, but we did have a week uh, when I got my, right after I got my Corey Stevens queens where we had 15 20 mile an hour winds and i had really poor mating success that week but you know the other times that i've mated queens this year i've had 80 90 plus percent so maybe they all swarmed during that really bad week i don't know this is disappointing i i don't they're so big and they're so laying worker i think i'm just gonna shake them out and uh Give their, give their boxes to somebody that can protect them. I'll, I'll just let these bees drift into the nukes beside them. The nukes will get super strong. I'll probably put their boxes on this, this big nuke right next to them and then move it over a little bit. And then all those workers will uh, drift into there 
and then maybe they'll refill a lot of this comb with honey before the end of the year. So this nuke right next to where that laying worker hive was is about to get really strong. They had maybe five frames drawn out in that third box and I just put three drawn boxes on top, but they're basically gonna become two colonies or a colony and a half anyway. So who knows, they may actually backfill all that for me. That would be nice. Well, this has been a fun day. It's in the high 70s. It's not even hit 80 degrees today. It's uh, about two o'clock, so I can go work in the honey house for a while. Gotten all of my hive work done. Well, that never ends, but I'm done with all the major points. And uh, man, it's just been a fun day. I love days like this. Feeding nukes and getting escapes put on honey supers and weeding through laying worker colonies. You know, just, it's like the, the animal husbandry part of it. Holding 25% and 88. Clean the extractors yesterday. They're nicely dried out. Things aren't gonna look this clean again for quite a while, I'd say. <laughs> I'm at 16% moisture on capped and uncapped right now. That's after two and a half, three days in the drying drying room. We're ready to go. I'm sure not all of it will be that dry, but if I get some that's a little wetter, this real dry stuff will dry that wetter stuff down. So it's Wednesday, a little after 11 o'clock, and I'm in a rush. We are supposed to get some pretty significant thunderstorms today, and first wave of it is at 11.45, and I've got to get a nuke into my observation hive to go to the school, so I'm trying to beat the rain to go do that. But I wanted to put wet supers on uh, my big hives out here so I needed to get some extraction done and I'm trying to get that all figured out and get my process you know I've got a new process sort of um, got some wrinkles to it that I'm ironing out and um, I just got like nine supers extracted so I'm just in a rush seems like I'm always in a rush We've got smooth sumac in full bloom right now. Um, I just got some footage of that. I also saw some sourwood flowers that a bumblebee was working. It looks like, uh, you know, they start opening at the back of the flower closest to the twig and then uh, little urn shaped flowers will, will open um, as it goes, on, goes down the little fingers. And, you know, if they're being worked already, then the back flowers are open. So we're probably right at the beginning of the sourwood flow, whatever that is gonna look like, good or bad or indifferent. So I need to churn through some supers in the next few days and get them back out on hives and I just catch whatever I can. I'm not super picky this year, you know, it'd be great if I could get a varietal and charge more for it, but I don't think I'm my operation is sophisticated enough to really worry with that right now. My main focus is just cash flow. I need to catch all the honey I can catch. And, and you know, that is my cash flow right now. So 
I just need to get everything I can, whether it's sumac and sourwood mixed or basswood and sourwood and sumac mixed or whatever it may be, as long as it's good honey, I just need to catch all of it I can. And that's my, that's my main focus. Boy, this road's terrible. So I just got back from school. I took, uh, I took three frames out of this little nuke right here because they were pretty weak and stuck at my observation high and they've been gone a couple of hours i guess and so now i need to get them transferred back before they just completely fall apart we'll see how pitiful they look here just don't know what to do i've got a little bit of time before i've got to go pick my kids up so i think i'm going to drive a southern loop that i'd like to put bees on next year and uh, just do some scouting for blooms and then i'll run back to town and get my kids planning on extracting the rest of i don't know i've got four or eight supers or something left in the honey house i got to get that extracted but i need to do some work on my extractors first i'm gonna bolt them down to the floor my big extractor started walking on me and caused a little bit of a spill that was no fun I'm really getting bored with this. Four and a half inch lag bolts times six. And I left my impact gun at home and I'm too lazy to go get it. <laughs> I would have been done with this by now if I'd just gone to get it. I'm almost done though. I had this, uh, this big extractor took a walk on me twice yesterday when I was changing settings and speeds and trying some of the automatic settings and stuff and uh, spilled some honey on the floor. So they've got to be bolted down. And I moved some stuff around in here. I'm trying to future proof a little bit because bolting them down is semi-permanent. You know, there's pain involved in moving them and I'd have to fill the holes and you know, it's a honey house. It's okay to have holes in the floor, but I'd rather not. I'd rather have them in the right spot to begin with. So I think I've got it figured out. We'll see. I've got to say that I really do love pulling honey with a skateboards. Uh, it is so much better than fume boards. It's just not even funny. I've used fume boards the last several years and to get them to work well, um, you know, you can you can try to use Fisher's Be Quick, which smells like almonds, and it doesn't smell bad at all, but it doesn't clear supers out that well for me, even on a hot day, hot sunny day. So what I've been using is Honey Robber, made by Man Lake, which is similar to Bee Go, but doesn't smell quite as bad. But both of those smell like vomit on a hot summer day. And when I'm pulling honey with fume boards, my wife won't even get near my truck. Even if it's in the carport, she wants me to park it in the yard. Um, it's pretty offensive. And the bees get mad. You know, they're just not happy. I think a skateboards are easier on everybody. It's, it's just like drinking a cup of coffee in the morning, like, ah, da, 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 da. I'm just gonna go pull some honey. It's not a big deal. Bees hardly even know you're there. It's awesome. So I'm back to this hive that I thought was uh, swarmed or requeened or something. Their population diminished. So I took their third box of honey. Just got that off the escape and in the truck. They've still got a pretty good population. So what I did is I gave them a third box back and a feeder with a gallon of syrup. And when I come and do my next inspection, if they are up here working and drawing wax, then I'd almost guarantee that they're queen, queen right. And if they're not doing anything and they're mean, 
and I'm sure they're queen less. And in either case, I think this is a good thing to do. It gives them food and buys me just a little bit of time to figure out what's going on with them without having to dive in right now because I need to go work honey. He's gonna bite your nose. Oh, Sadie, be nice to the turtle. He's gonna take a chunk out of your nose. Oh, Max. Hey guys, Nathan Duck River Honey. I believe this is number 19 in my vlog series on building a bee business. This week has been a lot, much lighter week than last week, and I'm kind of thankful for that. I could, I could use a little bit of a slowdown. Um, I've gotten a lot done though this week. It's, it just hasn't been as frantic and as many stacked big days. Uh, you know, those, those big days stacked day on day on day. Um, they just start to wear on you after a while. So been a little bit lighter week. Um, where we're at in the flow is sourwood is just starting to open. Hopefully we'll get something from that. Basswood, I've got a lot of basswood trees that have set flower, but the flowers have not opened yet. I did taste a hint of basswood in one yard, but it's just that one yard and it was just a little bit. So. I think the basswood flow is still ahead of us. Sourwood flow is just getting started. Bees have been working smooth sumac. I've seen them working that and I've been making honey from it. Um, it may be that or it may be something else, but I've had some outstanding honey coming in in the last week or two. And uh, you know that's exciting to see. I just wish there was more of it. So I've started doing my honey harvest um, using the skateboards. And first year using the skateboards and I love them, I absolutely love them. Uh, I pulled, I think I pulled 12 or 14 supers early in the week and got those harvested already. And uh, don't know how much I'm gonna net from that, five or 600 pounds, something like that, um, which is not a good recovery rate. And I wanna talk about that for a second. The honey I've gotten so far has been really thick, like running 16% moisture. And I'm using a Simple Harmony Farms on capper which cuts slits in the cappings. And then I go over that with a pin roller the opposite direction. So I'm cutting it vertically and horizontally. And uh, that usually does pretty good. My honey house, I'm keeping about 88 degrees, 90. It's holding that and 25 to 28% moisture. So I'm um, drying anything that's uncapped down uh, so it'll be shelf stable. I should not be able to move the moisture content in capped honey that much. So I think the honey's just really thick this year. I don't think it's me doing that, but um, the thickness presents a problem for me because that uncapper I've got uh, doesn't remove all of the capping and I'm having trouble getting all of the honey out of the comb. even running at full speed for a long time. I've still got some weight in the frames when I put them back in the boxes. So that's, that's something I can alleviate with management. Like, um, I gotta be careful how I say this. Um, I, I may run afoul of state laws, so we're, we're gonna be careful how we go about this. Uh, so what I've done is I've put wet supers back on hives. Now the bees will take that wet honey and reuse it. <clears throat> they'll pull the cappings off, repair the comb, and hopefully they'll refill that. Now when I do the final honey pull of the year, if I was in a state that allowed open feeding of honey, if it was legal to open feed honey, then here is what I would do. 
I say this because Tennessee does not allow open feeding of honey. It's illegal in my state. So check your state laws to see if this is legal or not. If I lived in a state that allowed open feeding of honey, then what I would do is I would go and pull my home yard supers off. I would extract those, get all the honey out of them that I could, and go put them back on the hives as wet supers. Then I would go and pull all of my out yards in and extract those, get everything out of them that I could, and then set them out and let my home yard rob those supers out. After the honey is robbed out of the supers, supers are clean, they go in the barn, then I can go pull honey off of my home yard again, and I'm gonna recover a portion of the unrecovered honey. Uh, those supers may be full, they may not, but I'm gonna recover some of whatever has, wasn't recovered before. So I can use the bees to help do some of the work uh, for me, theoretically, if I lived in a different state. So uh, there are some management things that I could do, but this, you know, I'm gonna have to upgrade my uncapping situation at some point. I'm thinking maybe a, a chain uncapper. Uh, the Dakota Guinness would be a good one. I don't think I've got enough space for that. But my big problem is space in the honey house. I, I think maybe a Max Ant chain uncapper, I could, I could make that work. But um, I really like the workflow that I've got right now with the two extractors and mobile uncapping tray or mobile uncapping tank with the Simple Harmony Farm uncapper. I'm just putting boxes on the, uh, the uncapper and uh, uncapping and going straight into the extractor and then move the whole setup up next to the other extractor and uh, keep my empty boxes on the uncapping tank and everything. It works great. So I really want my uncapper situation to be mobile so I can move between the, the two extractors. The normal setup would be to have your uncapper with uh, two, ex if you're using centrifugal extractors, you'd have one on each side at the end so you can go into this one then go into that one from your uncapping tank. And uh, I can't do that. I, I don't have enough space in this honey house since it's made out of a shipping container. I can't set it up like that. I've got to have them along the wall. And that really dictates my workflow. So I've got to figure something out and get that upgraded over time. But the upgrades I need before that are gonna be a clarifying tank and a honey pump. Um, I just, I know that I'm gonna have to go that direction. So overall, I'd say the honey harvest is gonna be low this year, um, depending on, you know, we've still got sourwood, basswood. We may get some more sumac. Um, smooth sumac is blooming, but shining sumac has not bloomed. And I've got some yards with a lot of that in old clear cut, so that I could get some of that. Um, we'll see how it goes. Basswood can be heavy. It's a, it's a good honey. It's not my favorite, but it's good. It's got this minty flavor and uh, it brightens up honey. I think it's good in a mix. I think if, if you mix it in with wildflower, it, it brightens the, the whole thing up, but just pure basswood, I like it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy it. Uh, routinely, if that makes sense. Um, it's good in teas. Some people really love it as a varietal. Um, it's just not one of my favorite varietals, but everybody's different. So coming up, uh, I'm about to do two or three hours of wooden wear here. I've got to get some boxes assembled and uh, I got, I've got to get a lot of wooden wear done. I need to have a wax dip day next week because I'm gonna start having uh, nucleus colonies that need boxes that are growing. I'm, I'm feeding a lot right now, and those nukes are gonna start growing and need boxes, and I'm not gonna have them. So I can make about 24 uh, supers an hour, and I can make 120 frames an hour. And uh, so it's gonna, I need at least four hours of box making and eight hours of frame making and I probably really need to double that if I, I need to get all of my boxes made and wax dipped and then, you know, that'll take me into the fall and I won't have to worry about anything. Um, need to just go ahead and get this knocked out in the next week. Tomorrow, I'm going to Lewisburg, Tennessee to speak at the Tennessee Beekeepers Association Regional Meeting. I'm gonna talk about small scale honey marketing. So I've been preparing for that some this week. I, I practiced it a couple of times today. Um, so I think I'm pretty well prepared for that. Looking forward to it. And that means uh, I've got supers in the honey house right now. I think I've got 26 or something like that. 
that are drying and I will probably extract them Sunday afternoon and then try to get them back out on hives, get them redeployed. So a um, lot, lot going on, but the season is winding down. Like the, there's light at the end of the tunnel right now. I've got to get another cell builder set up in the next couple of days. I meant to do that this week, but it's just been busy and I've not done it. Um, I need to get at least one, maybe two more rounds of queens made and nukes. And then I think I'll be at, my, at where I wanna be uh, to go into winter with. It's getting a little late in the year to be doing that sort of thing. So I've, I've got, to, got to jump on that here pretty quick. So question and answer this week comes from an email I got from Kevin and Anita Schlosser. Uh, they say, the one big problem we are having is staying cool. My bee suit is the fencing veil type. I wear a baseball cap to keep the mesh off my face. I also wear glasses. Things roast in there. I melt like a snowman in Arizona. I drip all over my glasses and veil, mesh, and everywhere else into the hives. My glasses sometimes slide off along with my hat. It's something to see. I would appreciate any advice you have for staying cool and dealing with the heat. So Tennessee does get pretty hot and humid, and I do work a lot in the hot and humid. Uh, I've got a few things I'll cover. The first one being the suit. I like Ultra Breeze suits. Um, and you got, I've got to say this, um, I've got a background where I worked for a company that made sewn goods. So we made tents, backpacks, uh, outdoor gear for really hard use. It was a high-end premium, you know, premium quality company. And I've got some experience in sewn goods manufacturing, product design, things like that. I understand how things fail, how things are made, quality of components and, and stuff like that. And I've got to say that I respect how Ultra Breeze makes their equipment. Um, they are using number 10 YKK brass zippers. Uh, the only problem you get with these zippers is they can get sticky, but if you take a little wax and put on them, that lubricates them and it doesn't attract grit and dirt. Uh, you can also use graphite. You don't want to use an oil or anything like that. But other than that, this suit has been rock solid. Uh, this one is three years old, maybe, and still using it. I told my wife I was gonna have to get another one for next year because it's starting to look a little too authentic uh, is the word I, I chose to use. It used to be white, um, <laughs> used to be. So this is a ventilated suit. It's a mesh with a 3D spacer in between uh, two layers of mesh. I've never been stung through the suit. It does allow airflow through the suit if you have airflow. Uh, the veil, on this one is very good. I do not need a hat to keep the, the mesh off of my nose on this, on this suit. I just don't. So if you have to wear a hat to keep the mesh off your face, I'd say that's a suit design problem. It may be a fit problem. Um, I don't have that issue. So on hot days, uh, let's, start with, let's start with clothing. Besides the suit, I have to wear a blended shirt or a synthetic shirt uh, or wool. I can actually use a lightweight merino wool, but I cannot wear cotton. I break out in heat rash. I sweat so much that I'll break out in heat rash. Uh, this is a next level CVC or CQC, something like that. It's a blended and uh, I really like these shirts. They're, they're great. Good for hot weather, good for layering in cold weather. Um, so consider that. These pants are Wranglers, and I forget what they are. I get them from Walmart because you can, they're like the ATG, but if you buy them at most stores, they're $48 or something. But Walmart has its own variant of these, and they're like 26 bucks. They're, I think they're 96% nylon, 4% spandex, so they're stretchy, but they're an incredibly good hot weather pant. Um, you can sweat in them all day and they dry out fast. They let breeze through, they're comfortable. Yes, you can get stung through them, but since I started working without gloves, I don't get stung in the legs anymore. I just, the hives aren't as grumpy. It seems like working with gloves, I'm gentler on the hives and I don't get stung as much in the legs as I used to. So there's that. Other things that you can do, 
you can get one of these little contraptions. This is a, a neck fan. Um, it goes around your neck, under your veil, and it blows air up onto your neck and face. A lot of people swear by these. I find it kind of clunky and aggravating, so I bought it and tried it, and I've not used it since. Um, what I do, I don't wear a hat on really hot days. I wear a buff. That covers my head. It's basically a sweatband. And there are days where I will sweat through this enough that I still get sweat dripping into my eyes. So I keep three of these in my, uh, in my truck and I'll just swap out for a dry one if, um, if I do sweat through one. And then of course I've got an Arctic uh, insulated vacuum bottle water jug that holds in a gallon. And on real hot days, I will go through that a couple of times. Now, uh, last, was it Sunday? Saturday, I think it was last Saturday. I got too hot. I got much too hot uh, and dehydrated. It was at like 92 or something. I was making nukes and introducing queens into mating nukes and moving hives. It was a long, hot day. I drank a lot of water and I still got dehydrated. Mid-afternoon, I had a pounding headache. I started feeling weak and uh, my face was beet red and then I stopped sweating and that's a bad sign. So I urge caution, you know, use common sense, go get in the truck and cool off, go home, do the work the next day, something along those lines. Another thing that you can do, and I don't do this, is they make cooling vests. You can find them on Amazon where you can freeze them. They got freezer packs in there and you can put that around your chest and it will lower your core body temperature if you're out on really, really hot days. Um, I've not tried one of those. If it's that hot, I think I'll just plan my work around it and you know try to work early in the morning or late in the evening and uh, not be out during that time of day. So by no means is that uh, an exhaustive list, but those are some things that I do and don't do and you could do. I hope it helps. So coming up, um, I'm not done editing the uh, UBO video I did with Corey Stevens yet. I've, I've been busy and hoping to get that done over the next week and then post that next weekend. Um, th things will start to slow down a little bit in the next month and I should have a little bit more time to put into my channel. Um, so <laughs> there's that to look forward to, I guess. It'll be fun to do something besides beekeeping, um, you know, every day of the week. <laughs> and that's all I think about. It'll be fun to, to do something a little different for a while after things slow down. As always, if you've got questions, you can email me info at duckriverhoney.com. You can leave a comment. I pick something every week and try to talk about that. Guys, I appreciate you watching. I'll see you on the next one.